<clears throat> All right, we were at the end of the year. Just kidding. Uh, we combined chapter 1 and 20 together because it kind of talks to you about the overall beginning and end um, big picture outlooks of what we do in, in environmental science. Okay, so we're going to get right into it. Sustainability, economics, and equity. And for those of y'all who are not in economics right now, um, a lot of this is going to seem like voodoo alien words, like voodoo, voodoo economics, right? If you watch Ferris Bueller, you, you know what that is, right? Um, but I want you to focus on the things that I'm emphasizing because it's really not that you need to know um, how macroeconomics and microeconomics works to, like, you know, the, the, the min all the minutia and all that. You just really need to know how it relates to what we're doing, right, with the environment and with um, human conditions and how that leads to um, impacts on the environment. So really, you should be relating this to, like, your lab and some of the things that we were studying currently, okay? All right. Okay, so after reading this, you should be able to explain why efforts to achieve sustainability must consider both sound environmental science and economic analysis, right? Um, saving the trees and the whales at the expense of human beings um, will ultimately reduce the need for any sort of environmental science because we'll all be gone. So it's a reality that we're going to be here, right? We have to be here. And in order to be here, we need a system of trading um, goods and services. And so they have to be supplied by a supplier. So that's in a nutshell, economics, but we need to balance that out with environmental science at the environment, right? Because we get a lot of our resources from the thing around us. We don't just spontaneously generate the things that we want and the resources to make them, right? We have to get them from you know, natural sources, right? All right, so you are constantly balancing environmental science and economic analysis, and you're looking for a perfect balance between the two, right? And you're going to look at economic health and how it depends on the ability of availability of natural capital. So if you think nature... That's all that is, like the stuff you get from nature. That's natural capital. And basic human welfare. How well humans are doing um, are going, is going to be dependent on economic health. And it turns out you care a lot more about the environment and things around you and the future of the environment for your children and your children's children if economic health is good in the, in the short term. And you do things to ensure that it will be good in the long term, right? If I make a million dollars now but use up all the resources and cut down all the trees... Well, then guess what? That's a million dollars now that won't be able to be replicated in the future. All right, so what is this um, idea of well-being that we're talking about? Being happy, healthy, prosperous, right? It's fun for everyone. Economics is the study of how humans allocate scarce resources and, and production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. Okay, now what I really want you to focus on there is economics has to try to answer the question of scarcity. Scarcity, okay? The idea that things are finite, right? What does finite mean? It means that it's not infinite, right? Um, infinite means it wouldn't have a limitation, right? It would, um, it will finalize, it will finish at some point. So scarcity um, is a problem that we have with all resources. We don't have some inexhaustible resource with the exception of maybe the air we breathe, right? So something like that. Um, but everything else that we use that we need, so if you categorize all the things in your life and you talk about things that you actually need to survive... Um, those things are not infinite, even like water. You turn on the tap and the water comes out, you know, seemingly forever, but that's not always true for everyone, right? Yeah. All right, so supply, demand, and the market. I'm just going to give you what you need for apes just to kind of give you a general background of how uh, human demands affect the environment. So I'm not going to go too, too into the minutia of all this stuff because these are entire classes you'll take, okay? Uh, a market occurs uh, whenever people engage in trade. So hundreds of years ago, maybe even thousands of years ago, um, we didn't use coins like we do now, like fiat currency or like some sort of backed standard currency. We might have used something more like a barter system, right? Um, I'm hungry, so I need to eat. Uh, you have chickens, so I need to give you something that you might need, right? So maybe you have chickens, you're a chicken uh, farmer or whatever they're called, and um, you need something to defend your chickens and your farm so people don't just steal them, right? So maybe I'm a craftsman. I might do something like craft you this lovely... This lovely board with nails in it, right? So you have this lovely board with nails in it, and you're able to defend your property, and in return, you give me some chickens from time to time, right? So that's kind of nice. Maybe next time I'll give you a, you know, um, just like a big rock, and you're like, oh, here, you can defend your property with a rock. I crafted this for you. It's a lovely rock, okay? In a market economy, the cost of a good is determined by the supply and the demand. I mean, that basically just says that if you want something really, really bad, and there are a lot of people that want it, there will be some sort of supplier that'll come along and go, hey, 
um, I can make money or I can get some sort of utility, I can get some sort of items by supplying this to somebody else, right? And um, usually it's somebody who has a lot of um, land capital. Uh, they might have a lot of natural capital on that land that has the resource that people want, right? So it's not just like you can, everybody can get it because it's just there. Um, there becomes a supply and demand based on who has the resource, right? Okay. Price is a way that producers and consumers communicate the value of an item and allocate the scarce item. So you might know that from looking at gas prices this week, right? There's, there's seemingly supposed to be some sort of um, shortage, so there's a little bit of a increased scarcity of that, of that um, gasoline. So what happens to the price? There's a higher demand um, because there's less of it, right? There's a lot less of it, so people are getting a little bit scared. People are basically, you know, we in economics consider them rational thinkers, like, oh man, I better get this before it's gone. And so as a result, the demand goes way up. The demand goes way up. So here's like a supply-demand curve. Okay. So demand's going to go way, way up as the as the supply goes down, right? Supply is going to go down, so demand's going to go up. So that red curve's demand, that's supply, right? Okay. And here it is again. <clears throat> supply and demand with externalities. When the cost of emitting pollutants is included in the price of a good for any given quantity of items, the price increases. Supply curve shifts from, all right, so this is kind of a, a bunch of weird stuff, but what we're talking about, the idea of externalities, this is the important part of a supply-demand curve. Uh, most of the time, we talk about what a product is really worth, um, but what you need to consider is that if I make something that is harmful to the environment, either in the process of taking it out or the process of using it, maybe something like petroleum, um, which has problems when you take it out of the ground, like there's leakage, there's spillage all over the place, and of course, when you combust it, you get a lot of uh, CO2 and methane in the air, or NO, N2O, N2O in the air. And so that stuff um, causes effects on the environment. It causes effects on the ecosystems. It causes effects on human environments, uh, such as increased flooding, increased power of storms. Um, temperatures increasing will mean that certain animals and plants that needed a certain range of temperatures to survive may not be able to anymore. And that messes up the entire environment where we would get other resources from, right? Maybe somebody depended on harvesting the wood from a special type of tree, and that's how they made their boats and canoes, and that entire village was a fishing community, and now they can't do that. And guess what? You've messed up the entire economic system of an area because of um, an unintended consequence or an externality of some sort of other product that was being sold and manufactured. So really, and everything else, if you get nothing out of this ch entire chapter, you really need to get the point of externality and that's a cost outside of what you would normally think something costs, right? Besides just money, right? So oil costs money, right? Maybe it's two twenty-nine, three dollars a gallon. But the other cost that you're not thinking about is the effects it has on everything else around it. All right, supply, demand, and market. The intersection of the supply and demand is called an equilibrium point, and that's where the supply meets the demand, right? The, the amount that I demand is met by the amount supplied, and that's a nice happy point. If you have, and of course you get into like economic theory where if you're outside to the right of that equilibrium point or inside to the left of the equilibrium point, um, you end up with shortages and surpluses, right? So that's exactly what it sounds like. All right. So you can read this if you want. Factors that determine the demand include income, right? So if I have more money, I can buy more stuff. So this has to do with the idea of affluency, and this is going to matter in just a second, okay? This is really going to matter. So right here, this is the idea of affluency. And I'm sorry, it's kind of cut off, affluency. So the amount of money you have, right? The more money you can buy, more iPods and iPhones and stuff. The price of a good, if it goes down, you're going to buy a lot of it, right? Tastes, so if this something is out of style, if it's no longer a fad, you're not going to get it. Expectations, like, oh, I'm not going to get it now because I think oil is going to go down. Like I might, the, the price of gas is going to go down in the future, so I'm just going to wait. And, of course, the number of people in the market, right? So if I have a whole lot of gas, like, I don't mean it that. I mean, if I have a lot of um, gasoline for cars, um, but nobody drives a gas-powered engine anymore, then it really doesn't matter. It's not going to be a high demand for it just because I have a lot of supply. Does that make sense? So it's not always just the number of people that are living. It's the number of people that would have a need for that good, right? All right, supply, demand, and the market continued. According to the laws of demand and supply, when the price of a good rises, 
the quantity demanded falls, this makes sense, right? If I charge more for something, I'm not going to want as much of it. Um, everybody that is demanding the product, like, so just go with the same example of gasoline. Um, just because the price is high doesn't mean I'm going to make more money, right? Um, if I have $10 a gallon per gas, what is the likelihood you're going to stop at Valero and fill up your tank, right? You might, if you're on super, super E and you basically had to push your freaking car into the gas station, um, you're still probably not going to get a full tank. It would be like $200 if you have like a, you know, a 20 gallon tank, if you have a big old truck or something. You're going to get as little as possible to get you somewhere and you'd probably think about maybe taking public transportation, right? Does that make sense? So higher price doesn't always mean you're going to have you're going to have a whole lot of stuff. So let's look at the supply demand curve one more time. I don't want to get too, too into this, like I said, but oh well. Okay, so the demand was going to be this one. The supply is going to be this one. So the equilibrium point right here means that I have just the right amount of stuff that I'm giving out for the current price. And um, the demand is the exact same here. But if the price is super high here, the demand's here. Guess what? All this stuff right here is extra stuff that I can't sell. Right, so that's a that's that's a surplus right there, and surplus isn't necessarily a good thing. Right, because you have stuff that's not being bought. You don't have a lot of efficiency. Okay, if I'm here to the right of the equilibrium point, uh, what ends up happening is I can't produce enough for the demand, so I end up with a shortage. Right, and that's 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 pretty self-explanatory. All right, and right here, the cost impact of a good or service is usually not included in the economic price. And what do we call this again? I'm going to write it again because it's a very important word externality. Okay, so make sure you know externality or external cost, right, as the other name is usually called. So think about some things that are external costs for other products that we have, like so things like iPods, iPads, something as um, seemingly good as a lithium ion battery that goes inside of a, a Toyota Prius, which I drive, right, or some sort of hybrid vehicle. Those things seem like they'd be having less of an impact on the environment, but those lithium ion things, um, cadmium they have to put in batteries, they, they have to come from somewhere, right? So that's usually resource mining, and those have a lot of negative impacts on the environment. So um, I was actually, you know, if you want to decrease your impact and you're thinking about getting a new hybrid vehicle and you already have one, uh, don't, because it, it, the demand for that vehicle ends up creating a demand for the supply of those resources, right? So if you're getting 55 miles a gallon with your Prius and you want to get a new Prius that gets 60, you know, that... Um, is not necessarily a good impact on the environment, right? So just keep that in mind. Right? So these are things we think about as environmental scientists. You may very well know all that and still decide, hey, that's okay, like, that's, that's what I want to do. I'll make up for that impact in some other way in the future. Um, or maybe I'll give that car to like my brother, and so now he doesn't have to buy a car. Um, so those are all choices we make, but that's, that's the point of environmental science. It's not necessarily casting... Um, a black or white image on every single issue. Every society and every individual has different unique challenges um, that require a very informed position, right? So that's why we take classes like this, to become better citizens. Okay. Anyways, so this is what I was talking about earlier. Pollutants included in the price of a good in the sense of shifting the supply curve to the left, right? So just think about that for a second. If you're in economics, this makes a whole lot of sense, but don't worry about it too, too much. You just need to know that um, the actual cost of things goes up when you factor in externalities. All right, GDP is the value of all products and services produced in a year by a given country. You need to know what GDP is. Um, it does not reflect externalities such as pollution. This is the exam question. You need to know that. Like, if you wanted a more accurate idea of the amount that people make, you know, it just, it's not going to, it's not going to include those harmful effects on the environment. Okay, it's not going to factor in those things. So you need to know that's something that said, I can see that as a Roman numeral type of question, right? Uh, GDP factors in all the following, so like you could say relative affluency, the amount of production per capita or something like that, um, the aggregate of everything produced in a country, and then boom, externalities. So all the following except externalities, right? Okay, genuine progress indicator. I want you to look this up because this is um, what... I use to figure out what country you're going to get for your for your long research project. Um, I use GPI or something very similar to GPI. Find the GPI of your country, right? I want you to come in and, and, and know that value, okay? So you can kind of see. And that's kind of like this metric that they come up with based on personal consumption that people have, you know, or what are they buying, 
what are they buying? Income distribution, so how much money they're making. Um, what is the average income of the country in question? Levels of higher education, that stuff really, really matters, right? If you have a higher educated, on average, population, they're able to make um, easier decisions about the, about the course of their life, right? Imagine if you only had like a third grade reading level like my grandfather. It's incredibly hard to um, make easier decisions or make good decisions about your life if you have a lot less human capital or you have a lot less skills to be able to do things if, if circumstances change, right? Um, you're stuck with what you got, right? And that's not a bad thing. My, my, my grandfather was able to do some amazing things with just a third grade education, but that's, that isn't the norm, right? Does that make sense? That's not the normal thing that happens from having less education. That's, that is definitely the, um, the exception, not the rule. Yeah. <clears throat> Resource depletion, pollution, and the health of the population. So these are things that you should know. They get factored into um, the progress indicator of a country. <clears throat> All right, genuine progress indicator versus gross domestic product per capita for the United States from 1950 to 2004. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'm not going to go too, too much into that. So you can see that we are producing more. But our progress, our well-being as a society, are we happy, are we satisfied, is leveling off pretty heavily. And this right here is one of the metrics that people use for argument that we need to change something in our economic system. Um, to kind of balance this out because we are working harder, we're working longer hours, there's a higher percentage of people that have two to three jobs full time and they're not able to take care of business on their own. And that's, you know, you can make the argument in a country as affluent as the United States, um, that for this to be going up, but for this to be leveling off, um, you know, you can make some, you can make some decisions about what the, what the word to describe this relationship is. But our progress should be going up because we're America, right? All right, that's, that's me. All right. Kuznets curve. All right, this is kind of cool. I like this curve. This basically tells you what happens. You would think that because, um, because, at, because we do better with our economic system that we would be doing stuff to the environment. But look what's happening here. So as our GDP increases, so you have to be able to read, read these graphs, read graphs, it's very important. As GDP goes up, so as we produce more things, you would think, oh yeah, the environment's going to get better, but look what happens. In general, and there's always exceptions, we have environmental degradation, damage to the environment. And why is that? We're just coming out of maybe having like, at the best, middle school to high school education, and now we're becoming more skilled, we're becoming more technologically adept, right? We might have gone from, you know, only knowing how to do manual labor in a field to now we can work on computers and stuff like that. So because we can do that, guess what? There is now a demand for our labor if we're more highly educated. This makes sense, right? You see people that are given work visas from all over the world that come here and work at places like Samsung Semiconductor. I used to have friends from Korea, and they would get uh, work visas to come work at the semiconductor plant as engineers for a couple of years, right? So there's a demand for that labor, right? There's a demand for that labor if you educate yourself. That's what you're doing right now, right? We're trying to take AP classes and get credit. Um, so as they become more skilled, though, without knowledge of what their decisions do to the environment, without knowing what the externalities are, the true cost of a product, or the true cost of, of mining a resource, they're going to just basically have more money. They're going to be the same people with the same culture, but they make more money because they know how to use computers, right? They know how to, um, they know how to operate like a forklift or they know how to go to space in a rocket, right? So they're going to get paid more and they're going to buy things at a higher rate because, hey, I can buy things now. Now, it's not just people in America that can have cars. Now, me, uh, Jason Rodriguez in, you know, in Beijing, China in 1980, now I can buy a car, right? So that's cool. And all of a sudden, your neighbors can buy cars now. Uh, your cousins and nephews and nieces and aunts, uncles, all that stuff. We can all buy cars. So what's going to happen is all at once, those impacts are going to happen to the environment. At a certain point, though, you kind of get over like that quick growing pain of, oh, shoot, I'm messing things up with all these externalities. There, become, there comes a turning point when you can start taking that excess, that excess. But the money you've earned, your GDP increase, and you can start investing it back into the environment. You can start doing things that are 
that are that are not as detrimental to the environment. You know, like investing in solar panels, like reducing um, pollution, reducing runoff, making your cities, planning your cities out smarter. And this is something we're starting to see in China. All right, China is actually outpacing us in um, in solar technology. Right, they're going to beat us in solar technology. We're behind. Okay, um, and that's because they did this. It took us like two hundred years to do this, right? Because um, we, you know, we were the the four four front runners of the industrial revolution, and so it's not necessarily all our fault because conscientiously, but we had a very long period of doing this. China's has been much shorter, and they're still messing things up over there. But um, but they're making leaps and bounds, or we're kind of making very tepid progress here. Okay. All right. Technology transfer. This happens whenever a less developed country adopts technology and innovations from wealthy countries. And you, there's a picture in your textbook I want you to look at of um, some people sitting around in the, what looks like you know a third world country, but they're sitting outside next to a solar panel, right? Um, so those are things that they didn't have to wait and do the research on their own, discover and reinvent the wheel. You know, we're interconnected. We're a global culture in some respects, right? Especially when it comes to information technology and education. You know, it can be a very global culture. Um, so countries that are just coming out of like that first stage economic development, cultural, uh, not, no, economic development, can just get stuff from countries that have already done the work, they've done the research, so that's a good thing. Um, they don't have to go through the growing pains of the Kuznet curve and, and destroy the environment as they become, um, as they become more prosperous and their well-being goes up, right? Um, and we call that leapfrogging, okay? So technological transfer can lead to leapfrogging. That makes sense. So, like, instead of like making uh, natural gas plants and mining coal and all that stuff, you can go straight to solar panels. Which you know, we had to go through all these like five different steps of energy before we got to it. And now, just you know, Ghana can go straight to it or something like that, right? All right, here's all these capital things I was talking about. Uh, natural capital. Capital is like a way of saying like resource. Okay. Natural capital: air, water, minerals. Right. These things all seem kind of limitless. Maybe not so much minerals. Um, but but they are limited, right? We have water all over the earth, and you really don't... It's like chemistry. You don't lose mass, net mass of anything on earth, but where it's distributed, where it is scarce, is not equal everywhere, right? And usually where there's a whole lot of water that's potable, drinkable, usable for human consumption, very safe, um, it's not... Like, where you have that, you have a lot of prosperity. Where you don't, you don't, Okay. Air and water, kind of funny because we mess these things up in one part of the world and it spreads everywhere. Human capital, I was talking about this earlier, knowledge and skills. Manufactured capital, it's all the goods and services that humans produce. Market failure, when the economic system does not account for all the costs. That includes externalities. All right. Environmental economics, okay, this is kind of like... If you memorize some sort of catchphrase, uh, some good feel sort of thing, it's this guy right here, environmental economics. Okay. It examines the various policies, regulations that seek to regulate or limit air, water pollution, and other causes of environmental degradation. So the study of economics as a component of ecological systems, the goal of this is to find a balance between human needs and environmental needs, so that way there's a future for both. Okay. So that's like the feel-good answer um, so if they were asking, like, what's the best thing to do in this situation? Focus on economics, focus on the environment, or C, find a balance between the two so that way the environment is preserved for future generations. Like, that's the answer you want to pick, okay? So that's, if you're just a good test taker and you want to know, like, what's the lingo to know, that's, 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 uh, that's what you want to do. Okay, evaluation, the practice of assigning monetary value to intangible benefits and in natural capital. Um, so if I save this five acres of forest today, I know that it's going to give me hundreds of millions of dollars in the near future because I have all the services that the ecosystem can give me. All right, and we're going to get to this when we get to waste management much more, but right now we have a system of waste that's a lot more like this. Like we have energy, um, ecosystem services, so what we get from the environment, resource extraction. We might do this for a little bit. We do recycling, reuse, reduce, recycle. But in the end, it's all going to do this. We always get waste. Okay, uh, what we would like in a more sustainable economy is to have something that looks a lot more like. It. So we have the same inputs. This circle is a lot bigger and a lot more um, has a much longer duration. And we try to notice this red arrow, the waste. We try to reduce the size of it. 
and we try to figure out a way for this to leave the waste stream and go back into recycling. So this is the idea of cradle to cradle usage, right? So um, this is the cradle, the source, and we try to get it back to the cradle again. Okay. Ecosystem, what does this imply right here? That the ecosystem services is a cycle. So if we get some sort of product or a service done because bees pollinate things, and we're saying that they don't get wasted, the bees don't get wasted, we don't kill them, it means that we are maintaining the ecosystem for those bees to keep doing that for us. We are maintaining uh, mangrove trees so that they uh, provide flood barriers for us, right? Finally, okay, sustainable economic systems, and I just talked about this right now. Cradle cradle system for uh, material use and waste recycling. Um, manufacture of automobiles is one example, right? So there's some factories in um, Western Europe, especially like in Germany, um, that will take the car parts from old vehicles, especially ones that were just on the lot, and they'll take them out and repurpose them for the next generation of vehicles, right? Um, that means they have to develop a, they have to develop machinery and they have to train workers on how to do that, right? Because it's not very easy to recycle a car. Think about it. It's not the same as recycling a can, which is you melt down the metal and you just use that can again. You use that aluminum. Car parts, there's plastic, there's rubber tubing, there's um, metals, there's different types of metals, right? There's glass. Um, so these are much harder. But, I mean, in the creation of those, those machines that might be able to do that for us, um, you create jobs, right? You create jobs, you create a need for labor again. So there's a way to be sustainable and also balance that with economic needs, right? Does that make sense? Um, environmental problems and finding solutions to them is not always just it costs us money to save the environment. You can create jobs. You can create infrastructure jobs out of that, right? Like, think about it. Um, if we're switching over from one energy source maybe over to solar, people have to maintain those solar panels. They have to install those solar panels. I can envision a world where along every highway – we have solar panels all over the place, right? And they would provide shading to the cars, right? So you don't have to worry about the sun hitting you in the eyes all the time. And it's, they're powering the they're powering the street lights, and they're also giving back to the grid in the local area. So these are all things that um, that can also serve as jobs, job opportunities, right? So that's how we need to think. All right. So this is the first part of uh, chapter twenty. Have fun.